to have discovered fossilized teeth that are 400 million years old. I'm Tony Kornheiser, and they belong to a young UV brown. Oh, yeah. Oh. You just, yes, I mean, we haven't this. even gotten to the preseason, so and you just, you just took a shot at, at our, friend, our dear friend UV. Dear friend. Does love he him. not love it? Does yes. he not love it when yes. we talk about him? He does. He loves it. And we're happy to do it. Yeah. Welcome like to PTI, you. boys and girls. In today's episode, Aaron Judge walks four times. DeAndre Ayton hasn't spoken with Monty Williams. And Steve Young joins us for five good minutes. But we begin today with the Braves and Mets, who are now tied for first place in the National League East. Their three-game series, which begins on Friday, weather permitting, will likely decide the division title. The loser will not only have to play the wild card series, but if they then advance, they will face the rested L.A. Dodgers. So, Wilbon, winning the NL East, big deal, little deal, no deal. Tony, it, it's a bigger deal, I think, even than I want to admit, because I started off thinking about this issue saying, ah, you know, suppose you got to play the Cardinals in the second round instead of the Dodgers. They can beat you, and they can. But it comes down to this. Look, there's a lot of really, I mean, borderline great teams right now. You know, including, you know, the Dodgers and the Yankees and the Braves and the Mets and the Astros. They're, and I'm probably missing some. Don't, they're, they're borderline great teams. But, Tony, you don't want to have to burn them in a wild card round at the start of your rotation. You want to have them in at least that best three of five series, the second series, and four of seven, so you can get DeGrom and Scherzer. Because as far as I'm concerned, I still think, hate the Mets as I do, that the Mets have the advantage over every team I just named in a series because of Scherzer, DeGrom, DeGrom, Scherzer. So if you can avoid burning them and you got to win the division, then you need to win the division, which the Mets may need to win at least one and maybe two to get that done. But if you got those guys set up to start your rotation, to yeah. me, you're favored to beat anybody in baseball this fall. So I am aligned with you philosophically on this. Normally, I would say it doesn't matter if you win the division, just get into the tournament because you're going to have to play the good teams anyway. Everybody in the National League knows that eventually they're going to have to play the Dodgers because the Dodgers are the best team. But, Mike, if you have to play the Dodgers in L.A. coming out of what may be a three-game wild card series— Ooh. While the Dodgers pitching is rested and ready, you are at a disadvantage. I'll go back to last year. The Giants had the best record in the National League. The Dodgers were second. They're in the same division. The Dodgers had to go to the wild card. Then they had to play the Giants. They beat the Giants, but they were so sapped from what they had to do that they couldn't beat the Braves. And, Mike, they won 106 games last year, and the Braves only won 88. So if you can avoid, avoid it. that yeah. first series yeah. and win the division, go win it. And special it. circumstances for the Mets. And I know they got hitting. I mean, they got the number three guy in, in the league in home runs, and I think he leads the league and runs batted in. They, 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 they can win in a variety of ways, the Mets can, but – that, 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 that one-two punch, man, I would go with them right now against anybody in baseball. Aaron Judge has now been stuck on 60 home runs for seven games. Blue Jays pitchers walked Judge four times in five plate appearances last night. And while he did not homer, Judge did come around to score twice, and the Yanks won and clinched the AL East. Tony, are you okay with teams walking Aaron Judge as much as they are right now? Okay, the number, the rate of his walks since getting to 60 is alarming. He is walking 38.7% of his at-bats. That's more than double what he did all year at 15.7, and he led the league. So he's in the stratosphere now in terms of walks. I didn't think they were intentional walks. In each of those walks, Mike, Aaron Judge had two strikes. So the pitchers were around the plate. They didn't give him fastballs, but they were around the plate. I'd like to see Toronto pitch to him. Toronto's locked into the wild card. They're probably going to get the first wild card. They can pitch to him. But I understand it. I understand what's going on. And Judge is not chasing. He's content for the walk. They won the AL East last night, and he totally celebrated with everybody else. To me, what a pitcher ought to do is throw fastballs and say, let's see what you got, big boy. Scherzer would do that. Verlander would do that. But they're going to the Hall of Fame. Yeah. They're going to the Hall of Fame. This is baseball. And... Aaron Judge has gone up, in my estimation, as a teammate, as an unselfish dude. 
even though he's pursuing an individual record, which may be the most selfish record in sports. Well, I guess scoring titles in the NBA might be that. But Tony, he's doing what he's doing for his team. Not only not That's complaining, right. but celebrating, being embracing it, being of the moment. How can anybody say a negative word about this guy? And, you know, this is baseball. Walks are part of it. Other teams are trying to win. Not everybody wants to be part of a trivia answer. So, I, I, yes, I'm fine with it. That's what baseball's been for 140 years. And anybody who wants to obsess over any other analytical part of it, to hell with them. Let me just say this. I want to go back to yesterday. Yesterday I said that if Judge is stuck on 60 for the last 15 games, people would think that he choked. And you said he didn't choke. He's not going to choke. Babe Ruth went 15 games without a home run in his life. Hank Aaron went 15 games. The difference, Mike, is that Babe Ruth didn't go 15 between 59 and 60. And Hank Aaron didn't go 15 between 714 and 715. It, it will feel like, if Judge doesn't get it, and I hope he gets it, it will feel like the moment was too big, the pressure was too much. And I hope that's not the case, yeah, I hope it's not that the he case couldn't close either. the deal. Dopes right? are going to subscribe. Let's move on. That's the problem. We move now to DeAndre Ayton who was benched in Phoenix's terrible blowout final loss at home to Dallas in the playoffs. 33 points. Ayton then signed an offer sheet to play for the Indiana Pacers, which the Suns matched to contractually keep Ayton for the next four years. So here's the story. Yesterday, Ayton said he hadn't spoken to Suns coach Monty Williams since that game. Months. Mike, the Suns are your account. Yeah. Do you think everything will work out well with Ayton and the Suns this season? Tone, I, I, I fear it won't but I don't think it's going to be because the Suns are like the Brooklyn Nets, where you have unhappy icon, godlike star, and just a bad teammate icon and big star. You don't have that on the Suns, okay? The Suns don't have that personality in their two best players, Chris Paul and Devin Booker, who are problem solvers, right? And so I think they can solve it. And I think with Monty Williams, you got, you got cooler heads in, say, the Phoenix locker room than you do in the Brooklyn locker room. So I don't think these are going to be identical situations that you, you fight with this drama all season. On the other hand, Tone, they're dependent on what Aiton wants to do. Now, look, having DeAndre Aiton is not a liability. My God, he's a great player, a great young player at a position where there ain't that many of them. I'd like to have him. At the minimum, he's an asset. Can they solve this? Yes. Will they solve it? It's going to be hard. Yeah. Um, I read all the stuff that Aiton said. It sounded very professional. He said, this is just business. I'm here to play basketball. Don't worry about a thing. But, and there's always a but, he's got to be seething at Monty Williams. He hasn't spoken to him in months. He signed an offer sheet to go somewhere else. He's not in Phoenix of his own accord. He's in Phoenix because that's the way the rules yep, work. Yep. The Phoenix situation because of Robert Sarver could very possibly be a sinkhole. You mentioned Chris Paul and Booker. That's who that team is built around. It ain't built around Aiton. Aiton averages 17 and yeah, 10. But they need him. Jay Billis was on our show, compared him to Wilt. Wilt had those numbers by the second quarter. Mike, I'm not going to be surprised at all if when they are eligible to move him, after January 15th, they try to move I wouldn't be surprised either, be Tony. I wouldn't be surprised. You have but a team meeting and you don't talk to the coach? Tony, a team dinner? It's summer. You don't talk it, to it, him? It's summertime. That, 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 don't, get care, don't get too sidetracked by that. If they come the out of the was gate, Monday. if they come out of the gate quickly, I'm talking about what happens in November. I don't give a damn what happens in at the end of September. If they come out of the gate quickly and Aiton takes that step up where he's then a 20-12 and 12 guy, and they get off on a 15-2 and two start, which they are capable, okay. then you assess the situation from where you are at the time. Tony, but if they get off to 8-8, eight and eight, and, eight and, and, and it doesn't seem like it's working, yes, I'm with you. I wouldn't be surprised if they trade him. I'm just saying, if you ask me to bet against Chris Paul and Devin Booker when it comes, and Monty Williams, when it comes to problem solving and getting Sarver out of there, it helps. It helps. Nobody wants Sarver. So getting the stink of Robert Sarver out of there will help that franchise and help that team. So I'm, I'm just saying, yeah, I know I'm looking at it both we'll ways. 
It's a tough one. Yeah, we'll see. It is. Let's take a break. Coming questions that we moved him up one day in the weekly schedule. So we welcome in our great friend, the man who spent untold hours studying film of my footwork, Hall of Fame quarterback Steve Young. Let's go to Trevor Lawrence right away. Because, Steve, he suddenly looks like the quarterback that everybody thought he could be. Now, people like to say the light went on as if it's simply flipping a switch. But you played that position. It's got to be more complicated than that. What goes into making Trevor Lawrence look this good now? Oh, Tony, I mean, we, we, how much time do we have? In the end, there, the light does kind of go on in that there is a, I call it the anticipatory throwing. In other words, there's a delivery of the football. The speed of the game is so different from college, and it takes some time for some to try to figure that out. And the light does go on as you get up to speed, essentially. And then also you know that you need lots of help around you. You've got the coaching staff. You've got a GM. You've got, a, you've got everyone to support you. You can't be a great quarterback with tons of help. Clearly, obvious, the offensive line, receivers, you get all that. So more than anything, you need to be in a quarterback-centric environment. And that does not because you need to be pandered to or that you need to be uh, catered. This is not about that, but more and more NFL teams are figuring out that being quarterback-centric and focused is how to win Super Bowls, and you're seeing that come out in a number of organizations. And I think Trevor Lawrence is getting light went on, and also he's getting a lot more help. Steve, as you well know, there are people in the place that you live who wonder if the light's going to go on for Jimmy G even now, even though he's been to a Super Bowl, for God's sake. He missed Debo Samuel on a couple of occasions the other night, and people go insane, insane. Fans go crazy. But you played this position. When a quarterback misses what we think is an open receiver, tell us about what actually could happen there. Is this more complex than just not seeing a guy? What's going down? Well, Michael, there's two things that happen, right? One is that I actually don't see him. He's way, there was a Raider game. At the end of the game, we were down by four, and, we're, and I was just trying to replace Joe Montana. I was like, I need this win so bad in front of 100,000 and Candlestick. And there's a last-second play, and Jerry Rice is in the end zone waving his arms. <laughs> I don't see him. I get sacked. We lose the game. It was a disaster. So that stuff happens. That, that, but there's other times when I see it all. And like a defensive lineman will put his hand up and tip the perfect pass at the perfect time. And how many times did I want to take the mic at the, at the, you know, the, the, at the, at the stadiums? Like, excuse me, folks, um, that uh, was not my fault. That was the defensive lineman who put his hand up. It was a perfect pass at the perfect time. And so there are perfect throws that get screwed up. They're not, your, not necessarily your fault. But there's a lot of them when, like the other day, when you're not up to speed and you miss people that are wide open. It does happen a lot. Scoring is down um, five points from last season, and it's the lowest it's been since 2010, which seems like, a, a, like forever. Pass efficiency is down, while running efficiency is up. I know you have theories on this, Steve. Why is this happening? And is it good for well, the it's game? Pretty, it's pretty easy because look what the league is doing more and more. Do we, what do we hear about the preseason now? Like even the league is capitulated to it. It's like, oh, yeah, forget it. Coaches are saying, oh, we're not even going to play. How many quarterbacks didn't even play in the preseason? They're not like, look, we're, we've got 17 games. We'll figure it out in September. And we're witnessing that happening by the stats you just read. Offensive football, more than defensive football, is a choreograph, um, is choreography. It's like a dance step. The more, <clears throat> the more times that you run it, the better you're going to be at it. Now, certainly that's true for defense, but not as much. And the timing of such, defense reacts, quarter, uh, offense sets the timing. So in other words, offense by nature is going to be slower to develop. It's going to take longer to get the choreography down. We've really eliminated any chance to do it in the preseason, and we're doing it in September. September is the preseason. Offense is going to be behind defense, and you're seeing it. Why is the run game up and the passing game? Because the run game is easier to do. You can be a great running game faster than you can be a great passing game. And there's so many young quarterbacks today that are being asked to do great things. Talk to me in October because September is the preseason. It's just a great answer. We'll get you out of here on this. Tom Brady's Buccaneers have struggled on third downs. They're struggling in the red zone. Uh, John Romano with the Tampa Bay Times says that they need Rob Gronkowski back. You probably had receivers that you depended on. In your experience, how much comfort does a receiver like Gronkowski give to a quarterback like Brady? So, I, I, you know, I had Jerry Rice and Brent Jones. And, and I've said before that an all-pro tight end, I'm not going to say it's more valuable. What I'm saying is the explosives of Jerry Rice is 
you can't win without it. Can't. And Jerry always should say, throw me the ball, we'll win. He's truly true. But on third and four and all these little tougher situations, red zone, everything else, to tight end because of the proximity and where he works in the middle of the field and where, you know, it's like that's uh, it's heavily patrolled by defenses. If you can make inroads into the, in there with a great tight end who understands spatial relationships and can rub off people and you're on the same page, you can do such great damage to the defense with a great tight end. So, I'm, look, I'm not comparing. I'll take Jerry Rice any day, but a great tight end is a great uh, – the, the upper echelon quarterbacks know that a great tight end is your best friend. So happy you that you came on the show Wednesday it. and moved the schedule. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank Appreciate you. Right. you. You guys are the best. Much love to you. Uh, you can see more of Steve every week on Monday Night Countdown, this week featuring the Rams and the Niners. We will take one birthday, Alexis Diaz. Diaz is a top reliever on the Cincinnati Reds. The team is 60 and 95, so there aren't a lot of save opportunities, but Diaz leads the Reds with nine. He has a 6-2 and two record with a 1-8-1 ERA and 56 appearances in this, his rookie year, after being in the Reds system since 2015. Alexis Diaz is the younger brother of Timmy Trumpet's favorite reliever, Edwin Diaz of the Mets, who has 31 saves for a far better team. Edwin Diaz is 3-1 with a 1-3-7 ERA, so the Diaz brothers are both under two. On May 17th, they became the third set of brothers to record a save on the same day. Ravello and Josias Manzanillo did it in 1994, and Todd and Tim Worrell in 1997. And curiously, today is Todd Worrell's 63rd birthday. Tony Diaz is not the biggest guy out there at 6'2", 220. But on the mound, and maybe he's wearing an extra small jersey, he looks like Sonny Liston. And when you see him <laughs> out there, it's like, oh, my God, I don't want to face this dude. He's just imposing, yeah. man. And there are plenty of pitchers out there, 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, but I don't, want any, I don't want any part of him. No part. Not so happy anniversary Tom Brady on this day 26 years ago. As a redshirt freshman in Michigan, Brady threw a pick six on his first ever collegiate pass. Brady was playing behind Scott Dreisbach that year and backed up Brian Greasy the next year on Michigan's national championship team. Brady started as a junior with Drew Henson backing him up. But despite a 10-3 record, Blaney split snaps with Henson through the first seven games of his senior year before winning the job, leading Michigan to an Orange Bowl win over Alabama. Brady finished third in Michigan history with 710 attempts and 442 completions. He then was the 199th pick in the 2000 draft before fading into obscurity. <laughs> you know how people famously talk about the, bowl, the, the chip on Michael Jordan's shoulder? And they say it was like a boulder and he carried it around his whole life and he got back at everybody. Michael Jordan's chip is like a pebble compared to Tom compared Brady's to Brady. chip. Because Brady's happened in college and in the pro draft. And Jordan's was in high school. It was time to get over it. Tom Brady, people kept saying and kept saying and kept saying that nah, he's not good enough. He can't play. Sit behind this dude. And Brady's never going to let it go. And I don't blame him. Happy trails to last night's game for Richard Blyer. The Marlins pitcher got tossed last night after he became the first pitcher since 1900 to balk three times in the same at bat. Blyer, a seven-year veteran who hadn't been called for a balk in his first 303 major league appearances, was called for three balks while pitching to the Mets' Pete Alonso last night, allowing Jeff McNeil to score a run. After that, Marlins manager Don Mattingly came out to protest, and he got ejected. When Blyer finally got Alonso to ground out, he began arguing with home plate umpire Ryan Blakeney and Blakeney thumbed him. Afterwards, Blyer said there's a quote, it's the same move I've been doing for 300 innings. The stat geeks don't know how to handle this. 1900. They can't parse it. They can't see the divisional era or the get up era. 1900, kiddies, listen up. It's a while ago. There was no NFL, no NBA, no NHL then. None. One omission. Chargers say Joey Bosa will undergo surgery to repair his Ugh. groin injury. They don't expect the injury to be season ending, but oh, I expect it to hurt on. very quickly yeah. to the big finish. Let's do it. Lonzo Ball says he can't run or jump without pain. Your thoughts? It'd be hard for the Bulls in the East, improving Eastern Conference without that important guy out there. Jets quarterback Zach Wilson has been cleared, is going to start Sunday against the Steelers. Is that significant? He's their number one quarterback. High draft choice, sure. LeBron is an investor in Major League Pickleball. Does that make any sense? LeBron's like the golden investor. Yeah, follow him, because anything he does, if it wasn't gold already, it'd be gold after LeBron. Just look at his history, his portfolio. 
Golf Week reports the Saudi Tour is nearing a deal to buy time on Fox Sports 1. Is that a big deal? You got to be on television even if you have to buy the time. Saudis have money. Last one, Tyler Glasnow with the Rays. Makes his first start back following Tommy John. What do you expect? Well, he's got to go against the Guardians who've been hot, so it's going to be tough. But welcome back. He's a good pitcher. I hope he can stay healthy. We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. Let me get these names right. Mark and Chris Heckhouse. Shout out. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. You can get the PTI podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. And now...